Uh, this is the third part of our series. We've done the essentials of the faith. We've also done the pillars of the faith. And this is the importance of knowing uh, the true God. Tozier, in his uh, famous book on the knowledge of the holy, said, what you think of God is the most important thing about you. So stop and think of God. Whatever you think is the most important thing about you. Now the reason for this is very simple. Because ideas have consequences. Uh, in fact, Weaver wrote a book by this title, Ideas Have Consequences. For instance, Hitler had an idea and the consequences were 12 million dead, 6 million Jews, 6 million non-Jews. Stalin had an idea called communism, and the consequences were 30 million dead. Need I say anything about Mao, 60 million dead, or America, uh, freedom, of a woman to control her own body, 45 million dead ideas have consequences. But God is the biggest idea you ever cram into your puny little mind. God is infinite, limitless. Now it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that if ideas have consequences and God is the biggest idea you'll ever have, your idea of God has the biggest consequences of anything you will ever have in your life. When you're in difficulties, when you're depressed, when you're discouraged, every emotion in life, every experience in life is going to be molded by your idea of God because he's the biggest idea that you have. Second, we can't be like God unless we know what God is like. And we should be like God. Moses said, you should be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. God is holy, we should be holy. Jesus said, you should be perfect, uh, as your Father in heaven is perfect. God is perfect, we should emulate him. But you can't be like God unless you know what God is like. A godly person is a God-like person. But what God are you being like? Is it the God of Shirley MacLaine? Well, she waved at the ocean and said, I am God, I am God, I am God. Is the God of Star Wars? May the force be with you. Prepare to meet the force. What kind of God are you trying to be like? Third, we can't know the true God unless we know the truth about God. There's a fallacious idea that uh, floats in evangelical circles that somehow or another, everyone, as long as they're sincere and as long as they're trying, as long as they're doing their best, is going to uh, know the truth and come to know the true God. You can't know the true God unless you know the truth about God. And one of the sad things that we who work with cults find out is that these very nice Mormon neighbors are not worshiping the true God. That the Jehovah's Witnesses who are so sincere and knocking on doors aren't worshiping the true God. You can't know the true God unless you know the truth about God. John 4, 24, Jesus said it, God is spirit, and they who worship him can't do it any way they want, can't do it just because they're sincere, must worship him in spirit and in truth. That means that it's absolutely necessary uh, to know the truth in order to be truly worshiping God. Now, what is the truth? Jesus said, thy word is truth. And we cannot worship the true God apart from that truth. Suppose you're saying uh, things that dishonor, that are false about a friend or a loved one or a parent. Suppose you're telling lies about them. Is that honoring them? No, you can't honor God by saying false things about him any more than you can honor your parents by saying false things about them. God can only be honored by saying true things about him. 
So whoever is saying false things about God, and all of the cults are, is dishonoring God. True worship involves affirming truth about God, things that are worthy of Him, things that really stick, things that match His character. So true worship is attributing true worth to God. The etymology of the English word worship is worth-ship. And if you are saying things worthy about God, things that are really true about Him, you are worshiping God by affirming those truths. That's what we'll do in heaven, Revelation 4.11. We'll say, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things. He's the creator of all things. He's the redeemer of all things. Chapter 5 of Revelation, those are the two ultimate things uh, of which he is worthy. Four, we can't recognize false gods unless we know the true God. You can't recognize a counterfeit unless you know the genuine. In fact, government agents who specialize in counterfeits don't specialize in counterfeits. What do you mean? I mean, what they do is they study the original. They study the genuine 20 and 50 and $100 bills, and they become experts in them. And to become an expert, you have to look at them under a microscope, be highly trained, or you can't recognize the best counterfeits. Unless we're highly trained in God's Word, use it as the microscope through which we look at false gods, we won't recognize them. This is why so many people fall prey to cults. The devil is transformed into an angel of light. He has good counterfeits. And we can't recognize a counterfeit unless we know the genuine. In other words, you can't know what's not true unless you know what is true. It all gets back to truth. Who is the true God? What is true about the true God so that I can recognize what is false when I see it. Let's take a simple example from our culture. It's a New Age dominated culture, pantheistic. The invasion from the East occurred starting about the uh, 1960s and uh, took over in the 1990s. The God of the Bible is a person, not a force. May the force be with you. Prepare to meet the force. Uh, He's infinite, not finite. He's unlimited, no borders. He's not limited like the God of Rabbi Kushner, who was finite in power and in love. He's all-knowing. He's not limited in knowing. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything you're ever going to do in the future and everyone else is going to do. He's not like the God of Clark Pinnock in the and the open theists, so-called, inside of evangelicalism. Let me give you a few examples. Rabbi Kushner, whom I debated on the John Ankerberg show, in fact, uh, we debated three hours, three and a half hours one night, and John cut it into, I don't know, four or five programs, and he still plays those debates. Rabbi Kushner made millions off of a book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And here's what he says on pages 45 and 147. There are some things God does not control, and we need to forgive God for not making a better world. God is not only not all-powerful, but he's not even all-good. Now, I had to bite my tongue uh, when debating him on this. I felt like saying, well, now, you are one of the most arrogant people on the face of the earth to say that we need to forgive God. I think anyone so sinful and so stupid as to make a statement like that needs God to forgive them. But of course, I bit my tongue and didn't say that, but that's what I would have said if I uh, had a chance to. It's a false God. Another false God. This false God permeated our whole youth culture. The force is everywhere. May the force be with you. Prepare to meet the force. Uh, reunite with the force at death. Tap into the force, do supernormal things like lift the spaceship, you know. Uh, get a little green slimy guy in a pond named uh, uh, Yoda and he'll teach you how to do these things. 
not a true God. Now, the naivete of Christians absolutely amazed me when this Star Wars series came out because teachers at First Baptist of Dallas, a very fine church, would say, isn't it wonderful I can take my Sunday school class to the theater now and see a Christian allegory? No, no. Narnia is a Christian allegory, not, not Star Wars. Star Wars is a pantheistic allegory. That's a Buddhist, Zen Buddhist. He said so in his book, uh, Skywalking, which was a biography of uh, Luke Skywalker uh, where he said he got it from Zen Buddhism. Knowing false gods inside of evangelicalism, here's Clark Pinnock. He says, God's word has errors in it. God doesn't know everything. He doesn't know future free acts. God has a body, and we need to rethink the Mormon view of God, he says right in this section. And God changes. Now, the Bible says, I, the Lord, change not. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's not a shadow of change with him. And on and on and on. The Bible says God is spirit, not body. Uh, the Bible says God knows the end from the beginning. And that God cannot err. Hebrews 6, 18, it's impossible for God to lie. Titus 1, 2, the God who cannot lie. And so forth. What's amazing is the largest, most uh, fundamental evangelical scholarly organization in America uh, pronounced that that view was not incompatible with their statement that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Absolutely incredible. The book was called The Most Moved Mover. Well, God isn't moved by anyone. He's the unmoved mover. He's not the most moved mover. He's the most moving mover. He moves the most things, namely everything else in the universe, but he's not the most moved mover. Who's pushing God around? Uh, who are we to think that somehow or other our view of God uh, is superior to the one of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the early fathers of the Christian church? Five, idols are idols whether they are mental or metal. Now, I cop that statement from Martin Buber, famous Jewish philosopher, but it's a very profound statement. Idols are idols, whether they are mental or metal. And a lot of us have mental idols, and we don't recognize them. J.B. Phillips, who wrote the Phillips translation, you remember? He's going to do the Old Testament now. They're going to call it Phillips 66. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, at any rate, J.B. Phillips wrote a book, a great book, Your God is Too Small. And he has all these false views of God that are really no more than a big idol. I begin my class on the attributes of God by saying, most of you have a concept of God that's not any larger than Michael the Archangel. It's true. Because we just think of him as some great big something. He's not any great big anything. He does, isn't even in the category of big, bigger, and biggest. He's beyond that. He has only a category of one, infinite, without limits, without borders whatsoever. An idol is any object of worship other than the true God. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we destroy arguments in every proud obstacle against the knowledge of God and bring every thought captive to Christ. The only way to avoid idolatry is to know and live the truth about God. It's the only way to avoid idolatry. Otherwise, we may be engaged in mental idolatry. You shall not make for yourself any carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. If you can get an image of God in your mind right now, it's not the true God. Because the true God is not imageable. You can't get an image because every image you get has borders. Every image you get has form or limits to it. God is way beyond that. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. High as the heaven is above the earth. Don't make any graven image of anything 
that is in heaven above or earth below. Six, we tend to become like the objects we worship. I remember taking anthropology in college and the teacher saying something like this, man is incurably religious. He must worship something. Three, he tends to become like the object he worships. We tend to become like the objects we worship. In other words, we tend to imitate our models. I have a grandson who loves Michael Jordan. I had a great picture of Michael Jordan. He uh, dribbled like Michael Jordan. Uh, he shot like Michael Jordan. Uh, he tends to imitate his model. We all do. We all pick someone and we model them. As I was growing up, I modeled my favorite uncle. He was the one that carried the guns, was the policeman, had the fast car. Unfortunately, he was also the one who didn't believe in God, who swore and cursed all day long. Guess what I did? Swore and cursed all day long, just like my uncle that I modeled my life after until I came to know Christ. We tend to imitate our models. God is our highest model. Now, if we tend to imitate our models and God is the highest model, what we think about him is of the highest importance in our life. I mean, we've talked about pillars of faith and we've talked about essentials of faith. This is more essential than that. Your view of God is the most essential thing in your entire life. You say, well, I believe the Bible is the word of God, but what if God was finite, didn't know the future, made mistakes and wasn't perfect, and this was his word? Makes a big difference, right? Because the word of God is no better than the God whose word this is. What we think about him is of the highest importance. Seven. We cannot know ourselves truly unless we know our God truly. The best psychology in the world is in this book because the God who made us and who knows us best is the God who wrote this book of how to understand ourselves and relate to other people. Therefore, any psychology that's not based on the Bible is not worth a wooden nickel. And you pay a whole lot more than a wooden nickel to get it. You cannot know yourself truly unless you know your God truly. Why? Because the best way to know humans made in God's image is to know God in whose image they're made. Now, that's not just a play on words. It is a play on words. It's profoundly true. The best way to know humans made in God's image, and that's what the Bible says, Genesis 1.27, Adam was made in the image of God. And also in James 3, 9, don't curse someone else who made in the similitude of God. The best way to know an image is to look at the original. That means the best way to understand a copy, namely us, is to look at the creator that we're a copy of. Now, when you go to the typical psychologist in our society, uh, they will tell you things like the Greeks said, know yourself. The Bible says know your God. Because if you know yourself, you'll never know yourself truly, and you'll never know God truly. If you know God, you'll know him truly, and you'll know yourself truly. Typical psychologists, and certainly most secular psychologists, will tell you, look inward and look backward. Wrong directions, wrong directions. The worst thing you can do for your already messed up life, and we all are messed up. Every time I say that, I'm reminded of the joke about the uh, mother hen who saw scrambled eggs for the first time. And she said, look at those crazy mixed up kids. <laughs> and God must be looking down on this world like a mother hen on scrambled eggs saying, look at those crazy mixed up kids. And then you go to someone, and by the way, you can't unscramble eggs. Did you ever try to unscramble eggs and get it all back in the shell and get the shell put together? Forget it. We need to lay a better one. And to lay a better one, you don't look inward and you don't look backward. Two wrong directions. They always want to take you back into your past, you know. 
And if you go to New Age psychologists, man, your past is way back in previous incarnations. They'll take you back into before you were born, before you were conceived, into a previous incarnation and say, hey, the reason that you're the way you are is you had a bad experience in a previous incarnation and do all sorts of incredible things. Wrong way to look, whether it's a Freudian atheist psychologist or a New Age psychologist, don't look inward and don't look backward. The Bible says, look upward and look forward. Two directions. If you're really going to understand yourself, you're going to have to look at the original, of which you're just a copy. Now, my wife and I courted 187 miles apart. She was in Fort Wayne. I was in the Michigan area in the last uh, year or so of college. We'd write a lot of letters back and forth, and we had pictures that we sent back and forth. And uh, it's the next best thing to be in there, you know, have a letter, have a picture. But I can guarantee you when she came home in the summer, I didn't sit there and look at the pictures. And I didn't sit there and read the letters because I had the real thing, the original. The best way to know you, a copy made in God's image, is study the original. Study the real thing of which you're a copy. And to do that, you're going to have to look upward and ultimately forward, not backwards. Eight, if we don't live by what is above us, then what is below us will drag down what is within us. Now, most Christians, if you have anything but an angel that God delivered at your door, uh, have children that sometime or another are going to rebel. It's not a question of uh, whether they will. It's a question of when and how long. So forget about, I wonder whether they will. They will. But uh, how long and when? In our case, we have six children to two middle children. Uh, were the ones who uh, rebelled the most. One of them rebelled for 20 years, just from 18 to 38, not, not too bad. Uh, 20 years. And I remember one time when he was a teenager walking out through the woods where we lived in Dallas and, and saying this to him. Son, if you don't live by what's above you, then what's below you is going to drag down what's within you. Many, many years later, he reminded me of this statement as he came back to Christ and is happily married and has a wonderful little daughter who, by the way, at age three and a half in the backseat of their car and the way the church just accepted Christ uh, as a savior. The daddy, I want to go to heaven. He stopped the car, went back there and, and uh, led her uh, to the Lord. The Bible says... The lower will pull us down. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like the corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. That's evolution right there. What did Carl Sagan say? The cosmos is everything that was, everything that is, and everything that will be. And he even said we should worship the cosmos. Use the word. Just exactly as the Bible uh, predicted. The lower will drag you down. If you think the cosmos or the creation or any creature is ultimate, your life's going to be dragged down just like that creature. The higher will pull us up. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 14. Look upward, not downward. Look forward, not backward. Colossians 3, 1. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. If you concentrate on the higher things, it will pull your life up. You concentrate on the lower things, it will pull your life down. To succeed, aim higher. And that's true 
in the spiritual life as well. Nine, an ultimate commitment to anything less than ultimate will not ultimately satisfy. Now there's a little truth in most systems of error. Uh, one of the very liberal theologians of the 20th century is named Paul Tillich. He wrote a number of books taught at Harvard University. But one of the things I like about what Tillich said is that a religious commitment is an ultimate commitment. You're making an ultimate commitment to something you think is ultimate. Now, he also said, not everything you think is ultimate is really ultimate. Idolatry is possible. And an ultimate commitment to anything less than ultimate won't ultimately satisfy you. In other words, he was kind of summarizing, really, what um, Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes. Nothing less than the ultimate can ultimately satisfy. Remember, he lined them up. Wine, women, works, worldliness, wealth. All begin with W for some reason. He said, it's all vanity. There's no happiness, no ultimate happiness in any of that. Why? God has set eternity in our hearts. And we can't be satisfied with anything less. In his own words, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. And this was the reward of all my labor. Indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. My favorite book in the Old Testament. The most philosophical, the most profound, uh, the most true to life. He experienced it. He didn't just think about it. He experienced these very things. He had the most wealth. He had the most women. He had the most wisdom. He had the most everything that began with W, and he had no happiness under the sun. It was found in the S-O-N, chapter 12, verse 12, the great shepherd he referred to in the last chapter. Now, there are really only three ways that people have discovered in the history of the human race to try and find ultimate happiness. Add to their possessions. If you're not happy with one car, get two. If you're not happy with one home, get one in the mountains. If you get bored in the mountains, get one on the beach, too. If you're not happy with one suit of clothes, get two, not two, get four. Add to their possessions. It's materialism, right? Now, the sad part of it is that most Christians are materialists. We live in a materialistic culture. Uh, I remember living in Dallas, uh, Texas for 10 years. I've never seen a, uh, the 500 Baptist churches just in, in the Dallas area. I've never seen a more materialistic uh, culture. Highest suicide rate in Plano, just north of Dallas. Uh, everything to live with and nothing to live for. One of the highest divorce rates in the, in the country. That doesn't work. Add to your possessions will never make you happy. You know who thinks that that'll work? Poor people. You know who knows it doesn't work? Rich people. Rich people know it does not work because they have it. And they know it doesn't work. That's why who were the sons and daughters of these wealthy people? They were called hippies in the 60s. And said, who were the hippies? They had their... A uh, Nikon camera and their dad's American Express card uh, and, and ragged clothes and long beards and wandering around the country and reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and, and uh, all of these other books. Where did they turn? Opposite end of the spectrum, Buddhism. Harvey Cox of Harvard wrote the book called The Turn East, way back there in the early 70s. They turned east. Now, when you turn east, the most profound philosophy in the east is Buddhism. And what does Buddhism teach? All frustration in life is caused by craving, it's caused by desire. How do you get rid of that pain and frustration? Cease desiring. Desire less and less. Take away from your passions until you desire nothing. And then you've reached Nirvana, the candle flickers out, and you've reached ultimate nothingness. Now, did you ever see something that didn't desire anything? It's called a rock. <laughs> it's called a glob of protoplasm, you know. No passion at all. 
Well, it went from adding to our possessions to taking away from our passions. The pendulum never stops in the middle. The biblical way to make a person happy, redirect those passions. Don't negate the passions. Don't try and fill an infinite void with finite things, but redirect the passions to God who alone can fulfill them. The only one that can fill a God-sized vacuum is God. Or to put it another way, an infinite thirst will never be satisfied with the finite. An unlimited desire will never be satisfied with the limited. An eternal desire will never be content with the temporal. Ecclesiastes 3.11. God has set eternity in our hearts. Hebrew word olam in our hearts. The quest for ultimate satisfaction will never be fulfilled in anything less than the ultimate. I don't care where you go, what you do, what education you get, what training you get, how much money you make. You will never, never be satisfied apart from the living and true God, period. Exclamation point. Well, then how do I know the true God? How do I get to that point? Well, he has two revelations to us. Revelation through his world called general revelation and a revelation through his word called special revelation. Let's work on both of them. I love general revelation. I love the outdoors. I love trees. If I weren't a Christian, I'd be a tree hugger. Uh, I sometimes hug trees anyway. Uh, marvelous creations. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. I remember once when one of our students, who, of course, they're much more wealthy than the professors, gave me or, or lent to me his night vision goggles. And we had a cabin north of uh, Asheville. And we'd go out on the porch at night, and you could see, you know, hundreds and hundreds of stars. But when you look through those night vision goggles, as Carl Sagan would say, you could see billions and billions. I mean, it's incredible how many there are up there. It just magnified God. And he also has a special revelation in his Bible. Through his word, Romans 1.19 says, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. If you can look up at the heavens and not believe that there's a creator, you've been to some of uh, philosophy school that has distorted your thinking and given you a set of lens that distorts it, take them off and just look at it. The heavens declare his glory, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they're without excuse. And Romans 2, 14 says, if you look up there and you see God, just take a look in here. And you'll see that inside of you, intuitively, naturally, you know some things are wrong and some things are right. You know, for example, Mother Teresa is better than Hitler. Nobody has to teach you that. All you have to ask yourself this question. Which one would you like to babysit for your children? Mother Teresa or Hitler? Well, then you intuitively know that one is better than the other. The Gentiles who don't have the law, they don't have a special revelation, show the work of the law written in their hearts. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. I love that psalm so much. I memorized it years ago, and I recommend that you memorize it too. It has both general revelation in the first few verses and then special revelation. The law of the Lord is perfect in the second half of the chapter. One of the greatest agnostics who ever lived said this after he wrote his book, Defending Agnosticism. Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe. The oftener and more steadily we reflect on them. The starry heaven above me and the moral law within me. Duh. <laughs> Duh. He, he couldn't deny. There's the creator. Couldn't deny there's a moral lawgiver, even though he tried to disprove uh, God by philosophical arguments. 
he was still impressed with the very two things Psalm 19, Romans 1 19, and 2 12 say. How to know God? Through his world, through his word. His written word, the Bible, and his living word, Christ. Just so we would not have any excuse for not knowing him, just so no one could ever say, well, if God were a human being, what would he be like? God became a human being, so we know what he would be like. It's called the incarnation of Christ. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, John 1, 1 and 1, 14, and dwelt among us. You search the Scriptures, they speak of the Savior. The written Word speaks of the living Word. The propositional revelation speaks of the personal revelation. Hebrews says, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. In the whole of the scroll of the Old Testament, what does the Bible reveal? Christ. Scriptures tell us of the Savior. He who has seen me has seen the Father also. You want to know what God is like? J.B. Phillips, in his book, Your God is Too Small, says, He comes to focus in Jesus Christ. That's what he's like. He's like Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is God. God entered into the bloodstream of humanity, and we beheld him as the only begotten of the Father. The Son being the brightness of his glory and the express image of the Father's person, Hebrews 1.3. Now, know in the Bible is generally the Greek word gnosko, which means to know by experience. We must know the truth about him, and we must live the truth about him. You can't really know God unless you know him by experience. Just knowing that he is God is insufficient. You've got to know God, not that he is God. And when you know God, you know the true God, and you'll live the truth about him. By the way, for your reading, if you haven't read all of these books, I won't even take a survey whether uh, there's anyone in here who hasn't read any of these books. That would be really embarrassing. If this is the most important topic, if what I've told you up to this point is true or has any substantial truth in it, that this subject of knowing God and knowing the true God is really important, and I've tried to say more than that, now you should have read J.I. Packer, Knowing God, J.B. Phillips, Your God is Too Small, A.W. Tozier, Knowledge of the Holy, Tozier's Pursuit of God, R.C. Sproul's book, The Holiness of God, and a book that all my students used to complain about because there's two volumes in one, and they said, why do we have to read a 300-year-old theologian? And my answer was, because nobody has written a better book since. Sharnock, a Puritan, wrote The Existence and Attributes of God. Now, these were sermons by a Puritan preacher to dumb farmers, quote-unquote. And our seminary students said were complaining about it. Well, either that shows that the dumbing down of America has dumbed us down more than we thought, uh, or something's wrong somewhere. Thomas Aquinas, the Summa Theologica, Whenever I'm asked what are the two books outside the Bible influence you the most, I say Eric Sauer, Dawn of World Redemption, Triumph of the Crucified, Thomas Aquinas, Summa Theologica. No more brilliant exposition of the existence and attributes of God ever written. Peter Kraft, if you can't understand the Summa, then read the Summa of the Summa, the dumbed-down version of the dumbed-down version by Peter Kraft, or if you'd like to uh, contribute to needy children or grandchildren, <laughs> read Systematic Theology, Volume 2, uh, by yours truly. If no means no by experience, we must know the truth about him, and we must live the truth about him by reading about God, and it's not enough to read about him, memorize the verses about God. Memorize verses like Psalm 119.11, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. 
knowing God will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from knowing God. Meditate on verses about him. Don't just read them. Don't just memorize them. Repeat them over and over and over again. Now, there's a little key to memorization, IRA, I-R-A, Impression, Repetition, Association. First of all, get it straight. Get the impression, what it is. Read it clearly over and over. So, uh, secondly, repeat it over and over. Spaced repetition. And then associate it with something. And, of course, uh, in the attributes of God, apply them to your life. Meditate on these verses. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Do you? I do. Literally. Meditate day and night. I, if I wake up in the night, I can guarantee you I am quoting scripture verses to myself, the hundreds of which I've memorized over the years, and I'm quoting great hymns to myself. Meditate day and night in his law. Read about it, memorize it, meditate it, sing it. Now, fortunate for my wife and anyone else that might hear, when I wake up and sing, I don't sing out loud. I do sing, though. I sing these songs to myself at night. Why? Singing etches the song on your soul. Memorizing will get it in your mind, but singing will etch it on your soul. My wife is not philosophical. She's musical and not philosophical. I'm philosophical and not musical. And I keep asking her over the years, can you explain to me what makes something beautiful? What makes a, a beautiful piece of music beautiful? Why is it that certain notes are beautiful and a certain other notes, like the ones that come out of my lips, aren't beautiful? She can't explain it uh, to me. But the closest I came to it recently was a great definition I heard in a radio just in passing. That music is pleasing sounds that are painted on the canvas of silence. See, a painter has a canvas and he has pigments. The canvas for music is silence. And if you put pleasing sounds on the canvas of silence, it'll etch it on your soul. Here's some. It ought to etch on your soul if you think uh, that the old hymn writers didn't know theology. I put it in white, and I challenge you to count them. Immortal, invisible, God only wise in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Twelve attributes of God in a few lines. Now that's a great hymn. Not only great music, it's great theology. God is immortal, he's invisible, he's wise, he's light, he's in, inaccessible, he's uh, ineffable, he's hid from our eyes, he's pure spirit, he's blessed, he's glorious, ancient of days, he's eternal, he's almighty, he's great, he's praiseworthy, 12 of them. You can't do better than to memorize a song like this and sing it over and over to yourself. It'll etch on your soul. Here's another one. 18 attributes in a few lines. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail. In Thee do we trust, nor find Thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Eighteen. You can search some contemporary songs. You can't find one attribute of God. It's like the study they have, the New Age study in schools called meology. At least they're honest. We used to study theology. Now they study meology. Oh, worship the king. 
I can't tell you how many times I wake up at night and sing this song, and when we lost our uh, daughter, I was singing that. It's just a little chorus from some musical in the, in the 70s. Uh, uh, my wife can tell you which one it's from, probably. God is love. God is light. He is faithful day and night. He is eternal. He never changes, though the seas rise up and swallow mountain ranges. There you got five attributes of God or one of my two all-time favorite songs, The Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of his love leading onward, leading homeward to my glorious rest above. I guarantee you that you'll come to know the true God if you sing that. Just add another one on the love of God. I was in a church once where they sang, I think, all three of these before the offering. I said, dismiss, let's go home. i got to preach. I've already been blessed. I've already... Uh, got everything I came for, what do we need any more? This may be, in my opinion, this could very well be the greatest piece of poetry about God ever written. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. What a wonderful tribute to the love of God. How to know the true God, read about him, memorize, meditate, sing, praise the person of God. You are holy who inhabit the praises of Israel. That means if you want to be holy... Uh, you need to praise God. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's why I insist that we put uh, praise items on our prayer sheet every time we do it. Remember, to succeed in your spiritual life, aim higher. In fact, aim a lot higher. Aim at God. Let's pray. Father, as the deer pants for the water, so our heart pants for you, O oh God. Help us to have a hunger and a thirst for you, the living and true God, and never be satisfied with what we know about you till we see you face to face in that blessed vision. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.